Okay, hello guys. I'm Lieutenant Colonel David Hunt. I'm going to run you through the <clears throat> exciting topic of nutrition on the intensive care unit. I'll talk about some general issues and I'll talk about a couple of issues specific uh, but not exclusive by any means to Frimley Park Hospital. It is a, uh, no pun intended, a rather dry topic um, so try and bear with it. If you smile, that will trick your brain into thinking that you are actually enjoying it. I will be crying inside if that's any consolation throughout the entire presentation. So um, uh, I, I feel your pain. Before I continue, I, I should add that I have stolen um, with, with, I think, his uh, assent, consent, <laughs> consent maybe, uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis's presentation. So this is a presentation that Dr. Stephen Lewis uh, had shared with me previously, and I, I have assumed that he will be um, ambivalent uh, as to whether or not I use it. And I should also credit uh, uh, one of our excellent dietitians, Catherine Reddy, uh, with um, her uh, advice. And uh, she has also shared a number of uh, slides with me for um, me to convey a couple of important messages to you. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at david.hunt at nhs.net. OK, I hope you get something from this presentation. So every good military presenter has some clear objectives. We will, over the course of an undisclosed period of time, because I have no idea if I'm honest how long this presentation will take, outline how uh, we can assess a patient's nutritional state. And we can do this both objectively and subjectively. And we'll talk specifically about a couple of the objective methods, the one in particular, which is the MUST tool. We will outline a patient's basic nutritional requirements, which is very easy to do because that's just basic science. We'll talk about refeeding syndrome, which is a much feared uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's less of a practical concern because we are monitoring our patients' bloods daily, or certainly we should be, particularly in those patients at risk. So practically speaking, this is less of a concern, but certainly something that we need to be aware of. And no presentation on nutrition will be complete without touching on it. Talk about different feeding strategies, both enteral and parenteral nutrition on the intensive care unit. And uh, I'm going to modify this final objective uh, because no plan survives contact with the enemy. And uh, instead of reviewing the literature, which I, I think would uh, really be outside the scope of this presentation, we will um, touch on uh, some of the literature and I'll give you a number of references and you can go away and appraise yourself of the evidence. But essentially, it is it is very diff um, difficult to um, construct reliable meta-analysis of um, nutritional studies because of the um, the differences in patient characteristics and lack of cohesion on feeding strategies amongst intensive care units across the country. Okay. Why is nutritional support considered important? Well, the complications of malnutrition are significant for our patients and they include but aren't limited to impaired healing, reduced muscle bulk, leading to delayed mobilisation. They, or patients I should say, can have an increased instance of lower respiratory tract infection specifically but also sepsis more generally. It can take them longer to liberate uh, from mechanical ventilation as a result of respiratory uh, muscle weakness also. Having said all that, it is important to uh, remember that evidence for this is limited. And as I've already mentioned, that is largely um, due to the difficulty in conducting large trials around and nutrition on the intensive care unit where we have a, a very uh, undifferentiated population which are difficult to control for in randomized trials. Okay, it's difficult to assess whether or not a patient is malnourished. Partly that's due to the fact that there is no 
standardised definition, but also because all of the various tools that we have at our disposal to to do this are not a hundred percent accurate. So the use of composite scoring systems like the MUST um, assessment tool, that's the malnutrition universal screening tool, is probably the way to go. However, of course, we start at the history, so uh, we see a lot of psychiatric disease on ITU is the patient anorexic, uh, bulimic, um, looking at surgical issues, have they had recent abdominal surgery? Um, other things that come to mind um, are alcohol intake and substance misuse. Clearly, if you're uh, suffering from addiction, then you're not going to prioritise cooking food. That's going to uh, fall by the wayside. Nursing home residents are often malnourished and elderly people with reduced ADLs, activities of daily living, uh, may be unable to prepare food and are therefore at risk of malnutrition. So looking at uh, examination, there are a couple of um, kind of finite measurements that you can take. Um, tricep skin fold thickness and hand grip both correlate to malnutrition. Um, if you're going to do either of these tests, you've got to make sure you're, you're doing it in a standardised fashion using the uh, correct equipment and measuring with the patient in the correct position. And obviously they need to, uh, certainly with a hand grip, they need to understand what they need to do, which is sometimes difficult on ITU. But both of them are relatively simple tests, so perhaps maybe of some use. Looking at the laboratory um, tests, so albumin, transferrin and lymphocyte count, they're generally all reduced in a malnourished state. They're not very specific, they can be reduced by a number of other disease processes and in isolation are almost certainly not very useful for um, making a judgement on a patient's nutritional assessment. But combined together in a composite score, they may be more useful. Um, one uh, measurement that isn't on there, importantly, is BMI. I've missed that out because it's included in the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, which is a five-step process which we will come on to look at in a minute. Okay, so this is the flowchart for the MUST score. As you can see, it's a, a five-step process. I'm not going to dissect it in detail. But uh, the three steps at the top include uh, looking at the patient's BMI, which is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. Whether or not the patient's had any unplanned weight loss, now clearly that's likely to be quite subjective and some of our patients are, through no fault of their own, quite unreliable historians. So that throws in a, um, a healthy uh, slice of... Uh, inaccuracy probably into this score for us and then whether or not they're suffering from an acute illness and have been unable to have any dietary intake for, for more than five days. Uh, it then involves uh, adding those scores together and calculating whether they're at low, medium or high risk and that's basically a, a graded response to um, the patient's risk of malnutrition and at the lowest end of the spectrum it just tells you how often you need to repeatedly monitor them and then uh, at the other end of the spectrum in the highest risk groups it involves referral to a dietitian and fairly strict dietary targets and monitoring uh, in order to uh, avoid sliding uh, back into a malnourished state or in, or in order to um, get our patients out of the malnourished state that they are currently in. So they love a definition in the FRCA exam. Uh, what's the definition of a calorie? Give you a second to think about it. 
Okay, so a calorie is the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degrees C. A kilocalorie or a thousand calories or calorie with a capital C is the energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree centigrade. <laughs> so a thousand calories with a little c is equivalent to one calorie with a big C, which is one kilocalorie. So for simplicity, when we talk about calories, we are generally talking about kilocalories, certainly when we're looking at food labels. But these are important definitions and often requested in examinations, so learn them. Okay, we're going to look at daily requirement requirements now. We'll whiz through these because they're fairly self-explanatory. Your total calorie requirement is approximately 25 to 30 kilocalories per kilo. And it's important to appreciate that obese patients don't need that much. We don't want overweight people getting more overweight on ITU. That is not ideal. Um, these patients will require a dose based on their adjusted body weight and it would be somewhat lower. The water requirements are 30 mils per kilo. Protein is 0 0.8 grams per kilo. Fat, 2 grams per kilo. Glucose, also 2 grams per kilo. Sodium is 1.2 millimoles per kilo. Potassium 0.8 millimoles per kilo and phosphate 0.25 millimoles per kilo. So when we're calculating patients daily calorie requirements we need to take into account for the vast majority of patients who are ventilated uh, who will be on propofol the calories provided by the propofol which as you can see are significant. I mean most of our patients will be on significantly more propofol than 10 mils per hour. So that's a nice little meal provided by the propofol each day. Remember, you'll also generate calories from citrate if you are using uh, citrate, which we tend to in our filtration uh, on ITU. And proteins will also be filtered by the filter. So there are um, there's potential for that to need to be replaced and patients who are being filtered uh, will will have different calorie requirements to those that are not but generally speaking the nursing and dietetic staff are all over this so it's more something for you to be aware of and um, you know, potentially uh, something that you might pick up as not being there rather than something that you're going to have to flag up as an issue every time you see a patient on a filter. This should all be um, taken care of. Protein is essential to all ITU patients. We know that one gram of nitrogen is equivalent to 6.2 grams of protein, which equates to 30 grams of muscle. And muscles are going to be essential to our patient's ability to rehab and get off the intensive care unit. Under extreme stress or um, critical illness, the requirement goes up to as much as 2.5 grams per kilo. The concept of nitrogen balance is useful if you want to determine whether your patient is catabolic, but it's really academically useful. It's not practically useful on a daily basis. You can look at your collected urine urea loss over 24 hours plus estimated non-urea losses which are um, your hair, skin and faeces. Basal energy requirements. So this is the the minimum number of calories required for us to carry out essential metabolic functions. Now, they can be estimated in a number of ways. 
Again, a lot of this is directly relevant to your exam. The Harris-Benedict equation links height, weight, and age and multiplies that by a number which corresponds to the individual's activity level. And the resulting number is the approximate daily kilo calorie intake to maintain uh, one's current body weight. There are a number of nomograms that do the same thing. And then indirect calorimetry uh, uses oxygen consumption or CO2 slash nitrogen production to estimate heat production. So that's very much an experimental means of measuring one's basal energy requirements. What are they? Well, they vary depending on how much work your um, body cells are doing and they can increase up to 80 kilocalories per kilo in burns patients who have particularly high basal energy requirements. So different substrates have uh, varying amounts of, of energy available per gram. So glucose, you can see you can derive four kilocalories per gram, fat, nine kilocalories per gram. And importantly, we see here alcohol provides a significant amount of calories per, per gram and this shows why many of our alcoholic or alcohol dependent patients simply get their calories from alcohol and end up malnourished as a result of not having the other essential nutrients that are um, or that come with a normal balanced diet. So during the process of starvation, the body begins to busily break down various substrates in order to produce glucose. So you get a combination of glycogenolysis, lipolysis, proteolysis, and gluconeogenesis. And regarding the uh, latter, this takes place predominantly in the liver, um, but also in the kidney. It happens in the kidney uh, to a greater extent in diabetic patients. And it's pretty much, I believe, a ubiquitous process. So it takes place in most cells, so plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and other microorganisms. So what happens during the process of starvation? Well your hepatic glycogen stores are depleted by about 48 hours. At that point you start to metabolize your adipose tissue through the process of lipolysis to produce fatty acids uh, for uh, energy and the brain can use uh, those ketones uh, as a source of energy. Approximately 20 grams uh, per day of muscle is metabolized for protein to make glucose um, for uh, the very metabolically active um, sites listed below, so erythrocytes, the arena medulla and the uh, CNS, and as well as uh, protein, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, fat will be used uh, for that reason as well. So the refeeding syndrome is uh, often talked about, it often comes up in exams. Uh, essentially on ITU we need to be aware of it, but because we're monitoring our patients almost every day, sometimes twice or three times a day, uh, there is less of a risk of this occurring, although our patients are um, more at risk uh, due to their uh, pathophysiology. So the refeeding syndrome is a potentially lethal condition um, which results in severe electrolyte and fluid shifts which are associated with metabolic abnormalities in 
malnourished patients undergoing refeeding from any route and we'll go on to have a, a look in a bit more detail about it. So tragically refeeding syndrome was, was first described uh, in Japanese prisoners of war and anecdotally reported in uh, victims of Nazi concentration camps during and, and after the Second World War. So uh, one such study was a clinical study of malnutrition in Japanese um, prisoners of war published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1951. They selected uh, 24 uh, patients for a, a special study. It possibly sounds ethically dubious, um, but I've not, I've not looked at the study in detail, I'm afraid. Um, the, these patients were estimated to have existed on a diet of approximately 800 to 1,000 kilocalories a day prior to admission to uh, whatever um, facility they were admitted to. Their normal weight in health was, was about 50 kilos. Their weight on admission to the facility was 35 kilos, so significantly malnourished. They were given uh, approximately 3,500 kilocalories per day and um, some vitamin supplementation. And unfortunately, of those 24 patients, five patients died as a result of refeeding syndrome. And uh, this study was certainly pivotal in um, the recognition of refeeding syndrome as a phenomenon. To take a, a contemporary example, this is um, these are pictures of Dr. Stephen Lewis, uh, who uh, was on the front line fighting Ebola in Sierra Leone. Uh, these these patients were all significantly malnourished um, with excessive gastrointest um, gastrointestinal losses, unable to eat uh, due to loss of appetite because they're feeling so unwell. And of course, more recently, we've all uh, seen the uh, devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic which has meant that you know these very very sick patients um, have put refeeding syndrome uh, back on the radar for us on ITU but we've always been aware of it and as I, as I said earlier we are always monitoring our patients electrolytes and blood so it is less of a risk but we do nonetheless need to be aware of it. Okay so now for a bit of basic science regarding the uh, pathophysiology of uh, refeeding syndrome. So initially you, your patient is starved. That, that means uh, gluconeogenesis has to occur through a process of uh, protein um, and fat catabolism. Uh, that leads to downregulation of sodium potassium pumps. You get leakage of potassium, magnesium and phosphate out of cells and sodium and water move into cells. Then when you give the patient a glucose bolus by refeeding them, your metabolism switches over to uh, glucose metabolism, which causes insulin release, which is a key feature. This increases utilisation of thiamine, which may lead to a deficiency of thiamine. Hence, these patients are at risk of Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. The insulin causes intracellular movement of phosphate, magnesium and potassium and you therefore get low intravascular levels of phosphate, potassium and magnesemia and it's these um, uh, laboratory features that cause the clinical features of refeeding syndrome. So those patients at high risk are listed below but I'll add to that and mention specifically those patients with anorexia nervosa, patients with cancer, those who um, have or are post bariatric surgery and generally those patients uh, it's a big category those who are malnourished they are often uh, also but by no means exclusively elderly patients so in terms of avoiding refeeding syndrome the mainstay of management is to introduce your calories slowly so in those patients at risk, you want to give about 50% of the requirements on day one and then gradually increase to goal. For those patients that are really high risk, you want to start at 10 kilocalories per kilo and build up for about four to seven days 
to your goal um, caloric intake. And then for patients who are extremely high risk, you, you might want to consider reducing that to five kilocalories per kilogram. Certainly introduce some ECG monitoring there as well. Uh, it's important to note that our standard ICU feed initiation protocol is suitable for patients at risk of refeeding syndrome. So if you just follow that, you should be fine. We're going to be monitoring our patients' bloods anyway, probably on an hourly basis. Uh, we certainly should be if in patients at risk. Uh, patients should be given uh, Pabrinex. Uh, a lot of our patients won't be able to uh, uh, necessarily um, tolerate uh, oral feed, so they may be on their parental nutrition, and these patients will be on Pabrinex 1 plus 2 um, TDS 30 minutes prior to feeding at least. And you can discontinue the Pabrinex once they're meeting uh, their requirements and their refeeding bloods are stable. Essentially it's around uh, good basic management and regular electrolyte replacement looking specifically at um, potassium phosphate and magnesium. So enteral nutrition is very much our preferred method of delivering calories to our patients. We want to aim to be getting that in within 24 to 48 hours of admission to ITU. If your patient's severely hemodynamically compromised on a lot of inotropes and needing a lot of fluid resuscitation, um, the uh, advice from the dietitians is to generally wait until the patient is, is fully resuscitated and um, a bit more stable, in inverted commas. Um, it can be administered in a number of ways, um, pre-pyloric feeding via a standard nasogastric tube, we'll talk a bit more about that later, um, or post-pyloric feeding through a nasogeginal tube for selected patients uh, with maybe higher aspirates or specific disease processes or surgical request, um, or via a PEG tube. Now, um, you know, early feeding generally uh, is considered to help be helpful in maintaining gut integrity and permeability, reducing the risk of um, systemic uh, bacteria uh, translocating and um, result in significant reductions in, in mortality from the studies that, that have been done. So there are a number of uh, different types of enteral feed, and I, I would say the best advice I would give you is speak to the nurses and the dietitians, and they will they will um, they will steer you in the right direction. Most feeds have got about one kilocalorie per mil, um, and the standard composition composition is about seventy percent carb, fifteen percent protein, fifteen percent fat. There are other feeds for specific. Uh, pathologies, so high energy feeds uh, where you cram in the carbs for those patients that you don't want to give large volumes of feed to, for example those patients in renal failure or heart failure, and then those patients that are not going to tolerate hypercapnia very well because it will increase their work of breathing, uh, so you want to give those patients feeds that have a lower respiratory quotient, so are higher in fat. Uh, proportionally to uh, other feeds. Uh, they're given continuously uh, over 24 hours to uh, smooth out our glycemic control. Respiratory quotient, I just mentioned it, it's important to, to be aware that uh, different feeds have different respiratory quotients, so your respiratory quotient is your, your CO2 eliminated divided by the oxygen consumed if uh, you're um, metabolizing carbohydrates then your respiratory quotient is one that's significantly less for uh, fat oxidation therefore making uh, feeds with a lower respiratory quotient more uh, suitable for patients who are not going to tolerate hypercapnia which is potentially going to increase their work of breathing We need to monitor our patients daily for intolerance of enteral feed, and that's going to 
be defined generally by vomiting, abdominal distension, complaints of discomfort perhaps. The patient may have a high NG output if they are on free drainage or high gastric residual volumes. They may have diarrhea or reduced passage of flatus uh, and stool. Regarding gastric residual volumes, so larger gastric residual volumes are used as a, as a marker of uh, delayed gastric emptying and may reflect enteral feed intolerance. However, they should be looked at in conjunction with the other symptoms mentioned previously. Now, the designated cutoff at Frimley Health is 400 mils, so gastric residual volumes under 400 mils are not classified as high. Frequently, we get misinterpretation from doctors and nursing, nursing staff about what constitutes a high aspirate. A chap called Montego in 2010 conducted a regain study which looked at gastric residual volumes of 200 mils versus 500 mils and mean enteral feed delivery was significantly higher in the intervention group, so the 500 mil cutoff. So those patients get more calories. And importantly, the incidence of pneumonia, duration of mechanical ventilation, and ITU length of stay was similar in both groups. So bottom line up front there is 500 mils is not associated with worse complications or outcomes, and can therefore be um, recommended as a normal limit for gastric residual volumes. We've taken a slightly pragmatic approach and gone slightly below that, obviously because we don't don't fully believe it. Um, but but certainly um, just be aware uh, when you're presenting your patients that you do not say they have high aspirates unless they they meet that criteria. You can consider adding in prokinetic agents such as metoclopramide and erythromycin. They've been shown to improve gastric emptying, reduce gastric residual volumes, and hopefully subsequently increase central nutrition delivery. Um, just be aware of side effects, so uh, cardiac toxicity, QT prolongation, uh, QT prolongation, sorry, and cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, just think about how long you are going to continue uh, the treatment for. Okay, the next three slides have been provided by my colleague Catherine Reddy. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. Hopefully, you can you can read uh, the writing on the various packaging. Uh, I'll let you have a read through. So I'll stop on this one. Uh, this is going to be the vast majority of our patients. When you're sending patients out to the ward, ideally. Uh, please send them out with a size 8 French uh, NG tube. Um, you'll note that uh, this tube is visible without the guide wire. The guide wires, they're largely to insist insertion. Here's a copy of our uh, recently updated uh, feeding protocol. Just take a few minutes to familiarise yourself with it. The nurses will, will be au fait with this, but it's important that you are too. So in those patients who we are going to be unable to feed via the enteral route, so either patients who there is an anatomical concern about feeding them, so they've got a, a complex anastomosis, or they have a prolonged ileus, or any number of other reasons, we can provide these patients with parenteral nutrition. Now this can be given by via a, um, a dedicated lumen and a multi-lumen central line or we can use a pick or a midline or potentially even a peripheral cannula, cannula but we have an excellent vascular access team at Frimley so the vast majority of patients unless there is a contraindication to central venous um, or pick or midline access will receive parental nutrition by one of these routes. Um, you certainly don't need to worry about tunneling catheters uh, that are going to be used for less than 30 days which is in most of our patients uh, but if you are going to use a line for greater than 30 days it's recommended that they are tunneled however practically speaking that very rarely very rarely happens problems with uh, parental nutrition are um, initially related uh, to uh, line insertion, so the standard complications of central venous access, um, infection, metabolic disturbances associated with delivery of the feed, and um, potentially abnormal liver function tests. So parenteral nutrition is 
um, comprised of water, electrolytes, lipids, amino acids, essential vitamins and minerals. So we'll have a, we have a number of different bags at Frimley. Um, I would advise getting the nurses uh, to speak to the dietitians or speaking to them directly yourselves. We'll, get, we'll have bags for peripherally administered um, parental nutrition and we will also have different bags for centrally administered peripheral nutrition. These all need to be prescribed appropriately and we also have scratch bags for um, for patients uh, for example with specific requirements such as um, uh, fluid management if they have a high a stoma or fistula losses, electrolyte management for those patients in renal impairment or those patients with very high uh, losses of electrolytes. We have fat-free uh, feeds, uh, increased uh, nitrogen feeds for patients on the filter, feeds for obese patients, and we can also do uh, micronutrient adaptations. Uh, again, the dietitians will advise on all of those issues. So does nutritional support work? Well, this is a bit like the mythical a randomized control trial for jumping out of a plane uh, with versus without a parachute. It, it's just, it's, it's not going to happen, okay? You're not going to get volunteers or ethical approval for a, a randomized placebo controlled trial uh, when you have patients with an undoubted need for nutrition. You know, they are just not going to be randomized. And then Moreover, you've got the, the problems that I alluded to um, early on in the presentation, um, and they are predominantly centred around the heterogeneous nature of the patient population and trial methodology. So you've got um, different indications for intervention and exclusion between trials. You've got different levels of feeding. The control groups will be different, feeds will be started at different times, the route of feeding may be different, the duration of support might be different, and often uh, different outcome measures are looked at. So it's very different, uh, they're very difficult to put together a good meta analysis, uh, which you know otherwise might help to answer this question, but it is very difficult in this area. We'll come on later, we'll have a look at a few trials, but I think the main message is go away and appraise yourself of the of the literature. There have been a few attempts over the years to um, provide feed and rich with various um, pharmacanutrients, so arginine, and glutamine and omega-3 fatty acids to name but a few, and this is an attempt to uh, reduce the oxidative stress and SERS response that you get with a lot of critical illness. So although it's scientifically sound, uh, none of these uh, immunonutrients has any proven uh, benefit. And it's not something that as far as I'm aware that we um, partake in at Frimley Park Hospital. So we talked already about some of the problems with conducting large RCTs around nutrition on the intensive care unit. And uh, this is a list that my colleague Stephen Lewis compiled of relevant studies a couple of years ago. I'll just draw your attention to uh, the first two studies, which are probably the, the most significant, at least to my knowledge, uh, both published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And essentially both demonstrating, uh, so calories demonstrated that enteral and uh, parental nutrition were both safe and effective means of uh, delivery of nutrition, uh, specifically that uh, parental nutrition didn't have um, a, uh, a higher rate of infection, which was a big concern prior to that study. And the EPINIC study uh, demonstrated uh, that Starting TPN later, uh, the definition uh, used by the study was greater than seven days, uh, as opposed to early, had no mortality difference, but did result in a reduced length of ICU stay and a higher infection rate in late TPN. Therefore, the vast majority of ICUs may consider carefully whether 
uh, the use of um, early TPN is justified. I, I have to say uh, we are pretty pro the use of TPN at Frimley and um, you will certainly see that some of our surgical colleagues are very uh, pro uh, the use of TPN and its use is uh, generally widely encouraged and supported. So I would encourage you to go away and appraise yourself certainly of the first two studies here and if you're feeling keen you can have a read of the others as well. Guys, here are some guidelines for you to follow. If you could have a look at both of these, uh, they're both useful sources of information. Geographically, we tend to gravitate more, I suppose, towards the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, but both of them are pretty comprehensive guidelines around uh, nutrition, so have a look at them both, please. Okay, a couple of uh, final messages. We're, we are very close to the end now, so, so bear with it. Um, so these, these are from Catherine Reddy, our senior dietitian on, on ITU. So firstly, she wants me to emphasize the importance of people misinterpreting gastric residual volumes. Um, so in the first few days of feeding, we're going to take four hourly aspirates. Anything less than 400 mils, as we've mentioned earlier in the presentation, is completely normal. Um, so I just need to remind you really that the aspirate is a combination of the feed going in, but also gastric secretions. And in the fed state, your stomach's going to produce about 150 mils of gastric secretions an hour. And I think most people aren't really aware of that. And other ICUs, as we mentioned earlier, will use 500 mils as a cutoff. So we are being cautious. We've talked about placing the correct type of NG tube. So we are going to uh, go for the uh, fine bore white uh, tube with the guide wire. And ideally, uh, in patients going to a ward, that should be changed out to a, um, a size 8 French tube, unless they're having issues with um, high aspirates or um, ileus. If um, I can ask that you all ensure that you document the insertion of the NG tube in a bridle, uh, which uh, secures the NG tube in the patient's nose if it is required. We obviously want to avoid never event of feeding someone into their lung so we need to ensure that the ng tube is correctly sighted and if you can obtain it the nursing staff can obtain an aspirate they will have a protocol for doing that uh, the bottom line is if you are unsure ask okay and i, I really want to emphasize that point if you are going to complete uh, or if you are going to initiate parental nutrition then the referral uh, must be completed by the home team. Guys, dry your eyes. We're at the end of the presentation. I hope you found that as enjoyable as I did. Catherine's provided me with some contact numbers for your information. Uh, just to reiterate, all of the ITU consultants and all the nurses will be very helpful to you. So if you require help, just ask. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I have discovered that I say M a lot, uh, so that's something I'll try and rectify. <laughs> but it's it's good. It's good to have insight into these things. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to working with you all on ITU.